The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. For a premier who is, by all accounts, by every measure, a populist, this was no longer a popular, easy decision. It wasn't just a, yeah, Paisel was right. Then, later on the agenda. There was a lot of resistance in the city, like corporate sponsors didn't believe in investing in a basketball team. So it was a lot of challenges, but it was also kind of this like exhilarating experience. People were leaving their jobs to take a chance to join the Raptors. With the Ontario Legislature set to resume sitting next week, we thought we'd focus on two issues tonight that have bedeviled the current provincial government for quite a long time and discuss whether they finally got a handle on those issues. We're going to talk Greenbelt and Peel Region, two issues which Premier Doug Ford has famously taken firm stands on, then thought better of it and retreated. So let's discuss this with Michael Tobe, columnist for several publications, including the National Post, Troy Media, and Looney Politics. He was a speechwriter in Stephen Harper's PMO. Amanda Galbraith is here, principal at Navigator and a regular contributor on News Talk 1010 Radio. Among other roles, she was head of communications for former Toronto Mayor John Tory. Kim Wright is principal with the cleverly named Wright Strategies. She's a former NDP advisor. And Martin Redcon is here, Queen's Park columnist for the Toronto Star, and we're delighted to welcome the Kansas City Chiefs of Provincial Panelists here today for a discussion about these things. And in the interest of full disclosure, as I often have to do when we discuss these matters, I just want to put on the record that my brother, Jeff, is a home builder in southern Ontario, and since we're going to talk about the green belt, we put that out there in the interest of full disclosure. Sheldon, why don't you put this graphic up and we'll just get a little bit of the background to our first subject, which is the green belt here. Building in the green belt or not is something the Ford government has considered. Let's go back to April of 2018, uh, when then candidate Ford was caught on video pledging to open the green belt to development. The following month, he said the people have spoken and we won't touch the green belt. But then in 2023, green belt development was back on. And then in September of 2023, Ford apologized for breaking his promise. He pledged no more development in the Green Belt and, of course, in the process, lost two cabinet ministers to resignation. So let's start on this. Amanda, to you first. Is this story over? I don't think it's over because we know there's an ongoing investigation, so that continues. But I think as far as what the public is paying attention to on the green belt ups and downs, I think most people have moved on to affordability and those sorts of issues. So I think the Premier's continued ability, like Teflon-like ability, to take a hit, have it sort of, you know, fade away a little bit, apologize and pivot, um, remains unabated this long into his mandate, which is pretty remarkable for a politician. More on that subject to come. Kim, how about it? Is this story over? It's not over because the, fundamentally the biggest challenge is, and I, I, I hate to say the Premier was right, but we still have 1.5 million new units of housing to build across the province of Ontario. I would actually argue it's probably closer to 2 plus million units, and it's not getting any better. There is a reason, Steve, that we have tent cities in municipalities across this province that may, may or may not have had a hidden homelessness problem, but now it's front and centre and municipalities are having to deal with it. They need to start building housing, they need to start approving housing, and all this, has, all this back and forth on Greenbelt has done is given in a, more an emboldened NIMBY movement uh, that municipalities aren't, uh, aren't living up to. And frankly, the Premier, I would have expected him to be more bold on how do we actually get these things built, and that's going to be a challenge for his caucus going forward. Michael, is the story over? Largely. I mean, I always believe Harold Wilson, even though I don't like to naturally quote a Labour Prime Minister, mm -hmm. who said, to paraphrase, a week in politics is a long time. So most people, like Amanda said, have moved on. So I do agree with that. Uh, the key, though, is messaging, and that is always the key that many of us in this panel have actually 
learned, been part of, or in many cases, given to others. And we understand that messaging is important. So naturally, even though the, what you showed on the graphic is a five-year gap as to the way Doug Ford, then, you know, Premier of Ontario looked at it then and the way he looked in 2023, the key is that it will be brought up from time to time. So while certainly Doug Ford and the Ontario PCs have moved away from this issue and are looking at other matters which are pressing right now, the point is that the opposition, obviously the Liberals, the NDP, the Greens and others, have to actually continue to focus on it, to be fair. But from a, from a conservative perspective, we've moved on. I mean, it was a mistake. It was badly handled. We'll talk about certain aspects of it. It could have been done a lot better, not in terms of developing the green belt, which actually I think is actually logical. It was the way it was presented. It was the fact that they didn't look at polls, which directly said most Ontarians did not want it. And they proceeded through in such a fashion that the image or the visage that actually was created from it looked awful at the end, and that's the big problem. Does the fact, Martin, that there are still a couple of outstanding investigations to report back, does that fact ensure that this story is not over? Well, absolutely. Whenever you say police investigation, people perk up. Look, I'm not part of the messaging panel. I'm a journalist, and I deal with messaging. But the message five, six years ago in 2018 was that the green belt will not be touched ever, ever, ever. And then the message changed back and forth, flip, flop, flip, flip. And I think the challenge is that, one, it'll come back when the police investigation reports. The opposition will raise it again. Absolutely, it has abated for now. I think the bigger challenge beyond messaging is that Doug Ford, you may believe that Doug Ford did this to enrich his cronies. We'll see. But at the other end of this, he really did this because he needed, he felt he needed desperately a fix for the housing shortage that Kim talks about. But he wanted a quick fix, a quick fix, quick and dirty. And that's what backfired. And I, even if it had gone ahead, I don't believe for a moment that getting some of those camera ready, uh, not camera ready, but those, those, those areas of the green belt that are, that are more serviced would actually deliver the problem. I don't believe that for a moment. It's a much more intrinsic and, and deep rooted a challenge to give us those 1.5 million units. What's your sense, Kim, about whether or not the Premier's prime motivation on this was getting homes built or satisfying people who had given money to his party. Oh, those are those are very different things, and, and both things can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the bigger challenges and where this becomes a scandal that continues to... The, the gift that keeps on giving for the opposition parties is you had things like his former principal secretary going off to Vegas for massages and, you know, deals being or may have been done at that point. Those just look shady to people. And, and that continues to give fodder to Marit Stiles and the New Democrats. And every time that there's a new investigation, this becomes, what is it about the people around the premier that are, you know, how, how these conversations, these deals? There is no question that we need housing. What is become questionable is how do we do it? How do we do it fast? And who's responsible for it? And honestly, uh, you know, many people will see my NIMBY tears mugs. Everybody that sits there and says, well, I don't want this type of housing or this high of housing, but I really don't like that there's you know, homeless people living on our street. Those two things have to get solved if we're going to tackle the affordability problem. Kim's right that two things can be, two, two different things can be true at the same time, mm -hmm. but it does, well, I shouldn't say it, I should ask you, do you think it, <laughs> do you think it looks kind of icky when when you read in the newspaper, for example, in Martin's paper, that developers stood to gain $8 billion worth of revenues from this, profits from this, uh, and many of them just happen to have given money to the Conservative Party. You could argue, I mean, the optics are not ideal, I think we'd all admit. We don't know if that number is true, by the way. That's what the, the Auditor General's put out. And right. with respect, like, we don't know how she calculated that. So I would just, I call the question that number. Um, second, I think, Parties donate, like a lot of these people donate to all the political parties. They donate to the Liberal government in the past. They'll probably donate to the next Liberal government. I'm sure Bonnie Crombie has a ton of donations on her on her record, issue, which is fine. So I think part of it is it's just how the system runs. People donate to political parties. They should, that's a legal thing that they're allowed to do. They also have run businesses where they develop land and they build houses. And if we want mm -hmm. housing to get built, people have to make money doing it. Yeah. So Correct. yeah, we can criticize the optics of it, but either you want to build a house or you all want to sit around and talk about it. And candidly, I want to build housing. Okay, but optics, I mean, we all remember a $16 glass of orange juice, right? Optics matter a lot. 
<clears throat> are the optics in this case, well, where would you put them on a scale from one to ten for the conservative well, I mean, government? Certainly, Bev Oda remembers the orange juice, but yes, not, yeah. not to attack her. But um, the optics look, I mean, optics obviously are everything in politics. They're everything in life in general. It's not great. I don't necessarily go as far as Martin to say that this is an issue where he was awarding cronies. My, one of my worlds is mortgages and investments, and I can tell you that developers will glad hand anybody that they want <laughs> to get what they need. And we saw pictures actually not long after the, uh, the first episode happened, we saw a picture of someone who actually was shaking hands with conservatives, with liberals and others, and he was in development. So it's not unusual to see that. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it looks good, and obviously to the average Ontarian, whether they know a lot about politics, whether they care for Doug Ford and the, and the Ontario PCs, or whether they're a cheerleader, they don't like seeing it. So the optics don't look good, but there are always ways to couch language to shift things aside and actually move it in a different direction. The key for Doug Ford, and one he's always been very good at, is when he makes a mistake, after a little bit, like everybody, because they obviously have their, their ego, their guts, and they don't want to say that they were wrong, he apologizes. We've attacked politicians in the past for not apologizing. He apologized. He got to it. Sure, a number of other people were rolled over. Todd Smith, you know, unfortunately, got caught in it, a chief of staff, a staffer. Not Todd got, Smith. Well, not Todd Smith. Um, Steve, Steve Clark. Clark. Steve Clark, pardon me. Sorry, Todd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, you're right, Steve Clark, someone else, and a chief of staff for another uh, individual, mm -hmm. they got hit by it. So the proverbial bus caught them, but at the same time, I think once they apologize and move forward and look at other issues, that's to their benefit. Don't Emer focus on it. MRC. Well, with the greatest of respect to my colleague Amanda, <laughs> I have been very critical of the Auditor General over the years. Mm. This time, I don't think she was wrong. She did the same math on the eight plus billion dollar calculation that applied to the gas plants. Remember the billion dollar boondoggle? She just looked at the future capture of profits. And, and it, was it, was, it was calculated not by her, but by AMPAC, the property uh, evaluation people that we all love. So the problem was that it was a fire sale in essence, because there was this enormous capture, this enormous delta that developers were able to reap. That's what drove people crazy, in addition to the cronyism. Uh, I think Dalton McGuinty, a former premier, once said that it's never too late to do the right thing. Sometimes it is too late. It was for him, right? Because the gas plants, despite him doing it just in the middle of an election campaign, did come back one, two, three election campaigns to hurt the Liberals. So we'll see. We can't predict these things in politics, especially in Ontario politics, which is so unreadable. But I do think that the, the, that the that Ford's Tories did take their time apologizing. Bless him for changing his mind ultimately. But Steve Clark, his minister, not Todd Smith, hung in until the bitter end. This is a minister who had called throughout his career in opposition for liberal cabinet ministers to resign and refused to resign until Labor Day when he finally saw the light. So uh, We should point that out, Amanda. There's been plenty of collateral damage mm -hmm. in this story. Now, the premier may have saved his government. He may have saved his reputation. He may, I mean, all of that is yet to be determined. But Steve Clark really got hurt by this. And Khalid Rashid really got hurt by this, another minister from Mississauga who had to fall on his sword. And two political staffers also, Michael's right, got thrown under the bus on this one. How does all that, how do, how do you, I mean, where in the equation does all of that come in? I think, I think Steve Clark in particular, we all agree, was a big political loss for the Premier. He was very well liked. He was quite, you know, in spite of, I think, this issue specifically, was viewed as a very competent minister. Um, so, yeah, it's unfortunate whenever you see political staff candidly, you know, get hurt. It's unfortunate when you lose ministers. I think... Broadly, the government, in spite of all of this, and I would say most politicians couldn't weather that, right? Losing two cabinet ministers, mm -hmm. losing a bunch of staff, having a series of police investigations, some of which are ongoing. Like, that's kind of wild to think that we're all saying, yeah, other than the police investigation, people have broadly moved on, but they've managed to do so. So I do think, you know, the other shoe could still drop. That was obviously a very challenging time for the government. We saw that in the polling numbers. But they have managed to move forward because I do believe the desire for Ontarians right now to get housing built in this province is real. And I think if they push that forward, my guess is the government will pivot in the next couple of months to probably trying to push a positive message around that, as they should, right? Because that's their job. Their job is not to look backwards in the mirror and say, like, oh, we screwed up really badly. It's how can we solve the housing crisis Kim talks so elo eloquently about. Well, okay, let me give you the last word on this. We, we all sort of hang out in some similar circles, but we also have our own independent circles that we hang out in. And I don't mind saying here, in some of the circles I hang out in, 
people aren't talking about this as much as they used to. They just aren't. So in your circles, has the public turned the page on this story? They largely have, except for they can't buy a house. Their kids are still living in their in their in their house, They're, so those kids can't go but, out. But Greenbelt as so, scandal. So Greenbelt as scandal is a pro, uh, uh, it, until something else comes out. Also say that if we really are interested in protecting, creating a conservation area, frankly, the provincial government could have just bought the land and <clears throat> put it into a trust, as opposed to creating this inevitable situation. And, you know, if you go back to the original development of the Greenbelt, some of that land was actually just for political convenience tossed into there. It wasn't mm. this well-thought-out uh, creation of, of, of thought and study. It was a politics decision. Rightly or wrongly. Then when you talk about the Auditor General having some number that is created, some of those parcels of land should have been developed. They had been developed right up against it across the street. I'm not saying it's a perfect scenario, but if you really were serious about uh, protecting this green belt, then the province should actually make those, make those folks whole that they bought it from, farmers in particular that they bought it from, that will go out and say, this is no longer developable from a from a from a farming community standpoint some of those parcels of land just aren't good farmland anymore. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? And that is actually the bigger challenge and I know I I ask more of politicians writ large but maybe we need to start looking at these things from beyond the crass politics, but what is actually good for it. And that becomes the bigger challenge of governing, not just politicking. I should ask one more question about this, Michael. I'll put it to you, and that sure. is that it... it <laughs> just don't ask me about Steve Clark. <laughs> no, I, you know, we'll leave him alone for exactly. now. Exactly. There did seem to be a kind of a back of the envelope. We're just sort of I know. freelancing and figuring this out as we go along. Yeah. No particular process, no particular oversight, no mm -hmm. particular fairness mm -hmm. about the way it all worked out. I mean, is that the way government's supposed to work? No, I mean, but that's the obvious answer. Uh, unfortunately, lots of things happen behind the scenes. Many of us have seen it. It's not nice, it's not pretty, but it does occur. But no, in theory, it's not supposed to happen that way. The problem is, it was, the, it was basically the way it was presented. It looked like people were doing things behind the scenes, even if they weren't. The contracts were not put up to tender. Kim's suggestions were not considered, where you could have made it to public land or given some stuff possibly to farmers and others and let it develop that way. There are naturally ways you can create hybrid. You know, where you have obviously a lot of residential stuff, buildings, otherwise, but you have green space. You could have balanced it out. That's why I've never felt that the green belt is something that is hands off completely. There are ways to do it. The problem is the way it looked here, it looked like they ran in willy nilly, that they just basically awarded a whole bunch of money to other people, and it all fell apart in the seams. Even if that's not the case, and I don't believe it was, that's the image some people thought about it, and that's the image that some people are going to remember come the next election. But generally speaking, most of us have moved away from it because there are other issues. Okay, speaking of moving away, let's move away from the green belt and talk divorce. <laughs> and by that, I just mean who? the dissolution, <laughs> not a who, but a what. <laughs> the dissolution of Peel Region. And uh, oh. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up this next graphic here. We all remember back in May of 2023, <clears throat> Doug Ford, Premier Doug Ford, pledging to introduce the so-called Hazel McCallion Act which would have allowed Mississauga to leave Peel Region, uh, of which it has been a significant constituent part for going on 50 years. But then several months later, in December of 2023, Doug Ford backtracked on the Peel dissolution plan, and Peel stays as is for the moment. Okay, let's go in inverse order this time. Martin, he's made two different decisions here. Which was the right decision? Oh, that's a trick question. I, I think the pattern is that they were they were both flip-flops. I think they were both poorly thought through. So I'm not sure what the absolutely right decision is. I think the politics is what was driving the decisions on this one as, as, as with the green belt. If you asked Hazel McCallion, it was an obvious decision. There was an imbalance for taxpayers, et cetera. If you asked Bonnie Crombie, the former, the then mayor, now liberal leader, again, Patrick Brown, mayor of Mississauga. Mayor Brampton. Uh, uh, Thank you. Not Steve Clark. <laughs> mayor, mayor, Patrick Brown, mayor of I'm never going to let this down. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and if you ask the mayor of Caledon, she supported this mm -hmm. back at the beginning and then changed her mind. She's now opposed to it. So, so sometimes there isn't an obvious decision and, and to govern is to choose. I don't pretend to be an expert, so I'm not going to choose, but I'm going to analyze what or, or argue what I think 
was not the right choice, which was to do this for political reasons and to take the path of least resistance. I guess Doug Ford finally had to acquiesce to Hazel McCallion, deathbed promise to her, went ahead and did it, thought that Bonnie Crombie, or perhaps hoped that Bonnie Crombie would remain as mayor of Mississauga once he gave her this gift. And then when she ran to be liberal leader and potentially will harvest all those Mississauga seats, now there's no upside for Doug Ford anymore. There's losing those seats anyway, and there's the downside of having Brampton mad as heck at him. Mm. And so I think that is the where I land on this, is it's, you have three former and present provincial party leaders, right? Patrick Brown, former conservative leader, Doug Ford, the current, don't like each other much. Doug Ford and Bonnie Crombie don't like each other much. All that triangulation, all that bad blood, and a divorce. Amanda, I, uh, take us back. Take us back to the deathbed promise <laughs> that Doug Ford made to Hazel McCallion that, yes, Hazel, as I sit here holding your hand, as you are about to expire, I give you my word, Mississauga will be allowed to leave Peel and then going back on that word. How bad does that look? I mean, a deathbed promise is quite something, right? From a, we, we'd all put our, we've all been probably with a loved one as they're passing, you make these commitments and uh, then politically you have to, you choose to reverse it. So I think that is, anyway, to me that's, that would be just personally like a lot to go through. I can't, knowing the premier, I can't imagine it was an easy thing for him to do. Like we can all talk about the cross politics of it, but I think he genuinely really liked Hazel McCallion. I think they were friends. Mm -hmm. And I think breaking a deathbed promise to a friend that was like one of the most meaningful things to her in her entire political career was probably not a small thing that he thought through and did. Um, but they did face uh, like a considerable campaign, candidly, mounted by Mayor Patrick Brown about the tax implication, the cost implications for there. So you can make I think that what we're talking about today is you can make promises or commitments or statements, and then when faced with facts, either publicly or privately, and maybe he knew these facts when he made that promise to her. I don't know that. Um, but he, they changed their mind, and I don't think that was a small decision for him would be my guess. For sure. You say facts. I want to go to you on that next, because there is one study that suggests that if Mississauga were to leave Peel, that the tax implications for the property taxpayers of Peel would go through the roof. Substantial. Now, when Bonnie Crombie was the mayor of Mississauga, she had a different study, a competing study, which said, actually, this will all be fine. So if you're a person trying to make a decision about this, I'm giving the premier a little bit of an out here. If you're a person trying to make a decision about this, you've got two competing studies, as is often the case in public life. What do you do? Well, there's a couple of parts to this, which is fascinating. If you go back to it, just after the 2018 election, the premier actually started doing all of these divorces, amalgamations, reamalgamations, reimagining with a number of municipalities. And in fact, some of those got restarted. You know, I look at uh, Niagara, Halton, uh, various communities across the province. So there is there is somewhere in, in some drawer, somewhere in a locked safe that would rival Al Capone is an old, is that 2018, 2019 report on what to do with all of these municipalities? What will it cost? What will it cost politically? Never to be seen from again, this, this, uh, this document. So now we're back at it. And what we've seen in, in Peel is, oh, wait, it's not as clean as you get the water waste, water treatments facility, we'll take police, you get social services, we'll take this. It's not a, you know, like we used to dole out our hockey cards back in the day, the not, got it, got it, need it, got it. This is substantial tax dollars. This is substantial renovations. This is a substantial amount of people who will be impacted. And for a premier who is, by all accounts, by every measure, a populist, this was no longer a popular, easy decision. It wasn't just a, yep, Hazel was right. This is, this is a lot more complicated when you start to look at the personalities and politics. And you then look at places like Brampton, which has been a bellwether from the last couple of campaigns. You know, the Conservatives have it all now. The New Democrats had it before. And when we start looking at the crass politics of who forms a government and how does one form a government, it's a little more complicated than a deathbed promise. Michael, pick up mm. on that, because that's a key thing here. The Conservatives mm -hmm. have all the seats in yep. Mississauga and Brampton, Correct. Well, except for the one guy who's uh, yes, now dropped right. out of cabinet and yep. sits as an independent. Right. But, but basically, talk to us about how the politics and, and hanging on to all of those seats 
is underplaying, underlying, I guess, all of what's going on here. Well, sure. I mean, you, you basically go to those who brung you to the dance. If you owe certain places, you're obviously going to look at them more fondly. For example, federally, when Toronto never elected Conservatives and we had Conservative governments, or very few at best, we didn't naturally go there and look towards them for ideas and answers. We looked towards, say, parts of the 905, the 519, the 613 that actually gave us members, created our caucus, and then we could build from there. Doesn't mean you completely ignore Toronto, but you do it differently. The same thing happens here. Brampton and Mississauga is primarily PC territory. You have a lot of ethnic communities and minority communities that have come in who are at least, if nothing else, resonating with the message. They like what they hear. They're content for now. Two straight majority governments. And it doesn't matter what the voter tally was. Everyone keeps using that. It's two majority governments. That's how you have to look at it. So that means you're content with what you currently have. But if things change, then naturally the game changes as well, mm. which means that at some point you may actually have to look at Brampton, Mississauga, and decide for yourself, do I have to give up on one? Do I coordinate with another? Do I build them together? Or do I move or, or look elsewhere? And that's really key to it. So yeah, politics plays an enormous role in this, whether people like it or not, and it's always going to. So that is part of a key of strategy. You have to go where your base is, and if your base is there, then that's where you stand. But the base is the whole region. Of I mean, course. That's, that's what's and the tricky base about is, it. Yes, it is the whole region, as of right now. Yes. Except, except that Bonnie Crombie has a head start in Mississauga. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget, though, that, that we talk a lot about taxes, but potentially one of the big decision points for a populist premier is that it now looks like, or perhaps always looks like, there's going to be job losses in this, mm -hmm. in this divorce if that had gone ahead. And the timing, the timeline would have been just perhaps ahead of the election. And that's the kind of mess that that government really doesn't like. You mentioned Parm Gill, who's dropped out. I wanted to just remind us that there are now four cabinet ministers who, have, who are gone from, uh, from, the, from the Ford cabinet. He left to run federally. He left to run mm -hmm. federally. Mom. We talked about Steve Clark, yep. Ali Rashid, and of course, Monty McNaughton right. took mm -hmm. his leave. Mm -hmm. uh, on his own initiative. So that's four ministers down in the midst of all of this tumult, all these zigzags. Well, okay, we got about uh, six minutes left here, and uh, let's get into one last big issue, which is, and you touched on it earlier, so let me come back to you full circle on this. Doug Ford does seem to have an amazing superpower, which mm -hmm. is to say he can go out there and step in three feet of manure <laughs> and get it all over him, and then come out before the cameras and really emote, apologize, and his polling numbers go right back up. Mm -hmm. As they used to say on television in the 50s and 60s, explain, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> I won't hit you over the head with a rolling pin. After <laughs> I do it. Um, it, it is remarkable, and I think it is actually his superpower, and it is rare, because he seems to be able to act as almost a spectator on his government sometimes. It's like, hey, Premier, what do you think about your government wasting... Oh, that sounds awful. I can't believe I'm going to get to the bottom of it. It's like, no, man, you're in charge. Like, how, how can you possibly... But he has, I think, been able to consistently kind of paint himself as an outsider. I'm not part of this machine. I think the longer he goes in government, I think the less that ability um, remains. But, yeah, he does have a Teflon-like ability to stand back and say, you know what? That was the wrong thing to do. I'm super sorry. Like, aw shucks, folks. Let's move along. Mm -hmm. And he's kept that. Uh, there are... I've actually never seen... A politician be able to do it as effectively as he has or as many times and as many times mm -hmm. but i also do think that in politics and particularly all of us as kind of almost like sports fanatics watching the, the thrust and, and parry of this um we really obsess over flip-flopping or changing your mind i think most people in the country most voters are accept that that's part of life and if you have facts in front of you that negate like that maintain that, then you can. So I think people care less about flip-flops than all of us do, yep. which is also why he's able to do it. How infuriated are New Democrats at being, <laughs> once again, watching the Premier do this over and over and over, seemingly successfully? Oh, look, there's a couple of parts to this. You expect the Premier to do this at some point. You're just like, okay, this is, you know, the usual, the usual thing. What I've actually been really quite encouraged by has been watching the New Democrats, in particular, Mart Styles, being out there talking about the closures at in Minden and the, in the emergency room, going. She just did a Northern Ontario tour, going into the mines, talking to people on the ground. What's happening? She is also promoting really interesting women-led businesses. There's a, a coverall manufacturer in Northern Ontario that makes it specifically for women. And you know, again, women in trade, something Minister McNaughton was quite good at talking about, but the rest of this government not so much. So. 
it gives you if you're if you're an opposition leader and the leader of the opposition you're going to go out and say he is here is what they are doing they are not going to fulfill any of these promises and these aw shucks. We're not getting the housing built. We're not getting the emergency departments up and operational. You're still waiting months and months and months, no matter how much gobsmacking amounts of money in, are in the Ministry of Health, you're still not getting your hip replaced nearly as fast as you should be. Those are the things that if you're an opposition leader two years out from from uh, from the next election, you're building up that database, you're finding those candidates, okay, you're finding I those issues. Make sure we get the other guys in before we run out of time here. <laughs> Tell me, are, are you concerned, as a, uh, as a conservative supporter, mm -hmm. are you concerned that the kind of aw shucks approach Doug, Doug Ford takes will ultimately have a shelf life? No. He's a master at it. I agree with Amanda. Amanda and I come from the same playbook, and it's not ours. This is something completely different. And the real key is, very quickly, it's Ford Nation, the ideology that he basically follows, or the philosophy that he follows. There's no current strand of it. I've written about it. It's quite interesting. It's a mixture of small-c conservative values or sensibilities. That's really what it is. He's not a, a hardcore small-c conservative like I am, like Amanda is, like others are, but he's got those sensibilities, so we identify with him. He's a populist. We've talked about this. He uses populism brilliantly. The aw shucks. Listen to me now, folks. All these lines, these actually work extremely well and resonate really well. Sure, it doesn't really, in Tony Toronto, it doesn't necessarily fit. The rest of the province, it works wonders. And the other key is retail politics. He was a master of it. Doug Ford and his late brother, Rob Ford, the former mayor of Toronto, were masters at this, better than anyone I've ever seen. And we've seen other politicians use variations of it. U.S. President Donald Trump, the former U.S. President, used it for some, to some extent. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson used it to some extent. Former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison used it lightly. The key there, those three are out of politics as of right now, although we'll see what happens with Trump. The only one who's left is Ford, and he's really the king of it. Not that anyone followed it, but basically, in many ways, they built the blueprint for it. Last minute and a half to you. Well, it works until it doesn't. I'm going to dissent respectfully, again, from everyone on the panel and say that, yeah, he has worked wonders with the apologias but, and, and, and the acknowledgement that he was wrong. But the, the, the one constant in all of those years, starting with COVID, when he started to the rollbacks, or even before that, is that he had weak opposition leaders. Right? So there was no alternative to Doug Ford. That's really what happened in the last election. And we don't know what will happen in the next election. We don't know whether Marit Stiles and the NDP will work wonders or whether Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals will gain traction. They already have. And Marit Stiles and the NDP, despite the, a, new, a new look, have not. And if you look at the polling, it, you know, Doug Ford was, went down to 34%, I think, during the Greenbelt mess. He's, he went right back up to 42% in yep. the aftermath in October. Right. He's at 38 now. But the NDP has been flatlining throughout. And the Liberals have been going up and down, leaderless and with a leader, along the way. But what's most interesting in the polling, and this will not come as a surprise to you, Mr. Pakin, is that the, the, when you look at the approval ratings for the leaders, they're almost tied, except for a lot of negativity for Doug Ford. But the one constant, all four leaders, all three and a half, including the, the Green leader, Mike Schreiner, are tied, dead tied, on don't know. Can you believe that? So 23% for each of them to 25% say, don't know. How can 25% of Ontarians not have an opinion on Doug Ford? That doesn't make sense. The point is, we don't know what's going to happen. It also points election. to why campaigns matter so much. Indeed. Michael yeah. Tobe, Kim Wright, Amanda Galbraith, Martin Redcon. Great of all of you to join us here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was only a few years ago that the Toronto Raptors were crowned NBA champions, but the team's start back in 1995 was far from spectacular. I sat down with sports writer Alex Wong for a little history lesson. But first, all this week we will be covering conversations from the Rural Ontario Municipal Association's annual conference. Tonight, a quick word about food banks. So my name is Carolyn Stewart, I'm the CEO at Feed Ontario. 
Food banks were supposed to be a temporary measure. They were built in the 80s in response to a recession, um, but unfortunately we still exist. Um, and really that's because over the last 30 to 40 years, we have slowly been chipping away at our social safety net and social systems that were meant to support that would ultimately make our services unnecessary. So um, I don't think you could ask a food banker in the province of Ontario who wouldn't love to shut their doors. Um, but how we would do that is through good public policy. So we need to remember that food insecurity is not a food issue, but rather an income issue. And it's about ensuring that everyone has sufficient income to be able to afford their most basic necessities. But, so that's through things like improvements in access to safe and affordable housing, that's labor supports through improvements to labor laws, and that's even re revitalizing Ontario's social support programs like Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support Program that are drastically underfunded and keeping people and legislating them into poverty. The biggest misconception about uh, food banks is that I think people have a very antiquated notion of what food banks are. Um, I think they have a very, we've done a very almost uh, victims of our own success in that we've, um, you know, people have that association between the 80s and food drives. Kind of when food banks started, that's what they associate with them, non-perishable canned goods that you give at your grocery store in the bid. But really that's just um, one aspect of food banks. Um, they do so much more than that. Um, over. 60% of the food that we distribute at Feed Ontario is fresh or frozen. All food banks in our network offer fresh and frozen food to their visitors of their services, but also they offer an additional myriad of services, tax clinics, job fairs, resume building workshops, childcare, um, you know, dental clinics, um, health supports subsidies for utilities, you know, all sorts of other things that are really wraparound supports to help provide support to those who are facing poverty. Food banks are incredibly innovative. I think sometimes people take it for granted. A really wonderful example is during um, COVID-19, both North York Harvest Food Bank and the Daily Bread Food Bank um, had a lot of locations that were closed down because they were located in public spaces, which were no longer accessible. So they actually partnered with Toronto Public Library um, to leverage their trucks, who could take a lot of weight, you know, books are very heavy, um, and leverage that to help deliver food, um, as well as utilize their spaces um, to make sure that they they could continue to distribute food to those out who are in need during this emergency time. Um, so I think that's just one small micro example of all of the innovation that's happening across the province. How did a 33-year-old entrepreneur and an unlikely cast of characters sell the idea of basketball to a hockey town like Toronto? That's the focus of sports writer Alex Wong's latest book, Prehistoric, the audacious and improbable origin story of the Toronto Raptors. Alex, appreciate you joining us at Maddie Ackler to talk about uh, your latest book, Prehistoric. The words that you use to describe the book, sort of audacious and improbable. Why do you use those words? Because, you know, it's funny, like in, in 95, when the Raptors started here in Toronto, like I was one of those people that they were selling to, you know, I was here in Toronto growing up, I was an 11 year old just discovering sports and basketball specifically. And I remember like being at school, being in this hockey town, you know, how basketball was talked about, you know, how it was a secondary sport and how a lot of people just simply didn't know much about it, didn't care much about it. As I was working on this book and really diving into the origin story of how the Raptors started up as an expansion franchise, there were just all these bits and pieces of things coming together, like the season ticket drive, them playing at the Sky Dome to start and them having to educate fans on how to watch basketball, like all of it just seemed like in those words described in the subheading of the book, like it was audacious, it was improbable that this somehow all worked. Let's talk about the actual roster that gets built on a team. How does an expansion team actually get put together in the NBA? If you ask the owners at the time, you know, John Batoke Jr. and the rest of the ownership group, they would tell you that the expansion draft process of putting together a first year roster was very unfair in, in terms of just competitiveness because Every other team in the NBA was allowed to basically protect eight players, basically protecting their best players. So all you're left with are guys with either really terrible contracts that they no longer want or younger players who they had drafted who hadn't panned out. So it's basically you're looking at a list of guys that like nobody else would really want. And that's really how the Raptors team 
was built to start through the expansion draft, a lot of names that people had honestly like never really heard of. You talked to a lot of people for this book, 140-ish Yeah, people. around there, yeah. Uh, and we're talking basketball players who are on the roster, coaches, uh, upper management, and even to people who work the day-to-day, -day, marketers, day game ops and such. People who are fans now, whether you're a casual fan or you've been following this team, they would never recognize these names. Why was it important to share their stories? It's one of the things that people always talk about is just the diversity of the fan base and you know how it's so inclusive of people of different cultural backgrounds in the city. And when I approached this book about telling the beginning of the franchise, what fascinated me was trying to paint that same lens um, through the diversity of the people that help put this team together. You know, I think about the different backgrounds that these people came from, people in the marketing team, people who worked on the dance pack, um, people who worked on the broadcast team. Um, you know, you talk about the players having different backgrounds as well. Some of them obviously coming from, you know, traditional American backgrounds. There's a lot of European players as well. Um, it was important to me not to just collect these different perspectives um, to help the readers understand exactly all that it takes to building a basketball franchise in the NBA, but also to spotlight all the people involved because the Raptors are this growing franchise. They've been here for, you know, almost three decades now in the city. I wanted people to know that since the very beginning, it's had a very diverse history and background, even through the people that worked with the team. You had mentioned John Bitoff. Tell me, why is he important when we look at the Raptors' legacy? John was, like you mentioned, he was 33. He was super dynamic and he was different. Like, you know, when you think about the traditional sports owner, you know, they, they might be, you know, a little bit more older. They might be less creative, I would say. John brought a hyper creative energy to the entire Raptors organization. And if you think about the Raptors, you think about their original logo, you think about their name, you think about, you know, the dance pack, you think about all these things that were very 90s and were very dynamic, it was very different, it was not traditional. This was all the genesis of John's ideas. Like he didn't wanna be the Toronto Maple Leafs, he didn't wanna be the Toronto Blue Jays. If they were gonna start a brand, if they were gonna start a franchise, he wanted something that would appeal to what he described as New Canada, which was women, children, and immigrants. And he thought that those demographics were not being appealed to by other sports teams. So everything in this book, everything about the beginning of the Raptors, like John has his fingerprints all over it. Did he succeed in that? To me, I can say definitively that he did succeed. You know, if you talk to Raptors fans today, they now yearn for the purple uniforms. You know, there's a nostalgia about what the Raptors were like back in the day, you know, beyond the fact that I think everybody knows like that wasn't a winning product in the very beginning, but there was a lot of excitement. And, you know, he played a huge part into making basketball and the Raptors cool here in the city. And I think it's had this like long lasting impact, like even to present day. I'm hoping you can help explain what is the job description for someone who's trying to start an MBA team from scratch? Yeah, I love that you asked me this question because this is literally one of the first questions that I asked John when I met him at the office to start this book because I was trying to figure out exactly all the stories that I needed to tell. So for John, you know, I think when you're the owner and when you're starting a team, the one first thing is you have to just hire people and surround yourself with people who can help you. So what he did was he pulled from a lot of different executives who had past NBA experiences from other teams. So people would come in from sales, people would come in from basketball operations. And you know, when you talk about the job description, when you sit down, the first thing that you have to do is you have to sell tickets. So once he got the team, there was a mandate from the NBA that had to sell 15,000 season tickets in the first year. So he hired a bunch of people basically off the street, kids in their 20s, and they were basically just cold calling people around the city for corporate sponsorships. They were calling individuals. The salespeople that I talked to talked a lot about how there was a lot of resistance in the city, like corporate sponsors didn't believe in investing in a basketball team. So it was a lot of challenges, but it was also kind of this like exhilarating experience. People were leaving their jobs to take a chance to join the Raptors, and some of them ended up doing that. And many of those people, those salespeople who were in their early 20s, some of them are now execs on like sports teams. Part of this job was to get people excited, but also explain to them how basketball is played. And one of the responsibilities sort of lied on the broadcasters in a way. Yeah, so, you know, in talking to Leo Rounds, who's obviously still involved with the Raptors broadcast today, 
when he was doing color commentary in that first year, like he would have a segment called rounds, you know, on round ball. And what he would explain was very basic things. And when I mean basic things, it was like explaining what a travel is, explaining what a legal defense is, explaining what a technical foul is, or even explaining the fact like, oh, like certain um, positions in basketball, point guard is called a one, a, you know, a center is a five. So they were very conscious that there was a new audience that was tuning in that might not know, understand basketball. You talked about this, a new audience and part of that new audience and the strategy behind it is a logo. Tell us a little bit about the changes that they had to make to sort of make it marketable to the audience that they wanted. John Bitto was very adamant about not wanting blue to begin with, because he said he wanted the brand to be global. You know, he thought blue with the associations with the Maple Leafs, with the Blue Jays, like would kind of limit him to being just a brand that people associated with Toronto. He also didn't want red to begin with because he didn't want to really lean into kind of a Canadiana theme. So originally the Raptor, the retro Raptor that is, that ended up being red was lime green. Like that was actually the one that was submitted to the league and commissioner David Stern actually stepped in. I think the conversation basically went, you know, the Raptor logo was already a little bit out there. Like if you compare it to traditional basketball logos, like the New York Knicks, the LA Lakers, the Boston Celtics, and David Stern basically stepped in and told John that, hey, we need something that does market to Canada. You are one of two Canadian franchises at the time with the Grizzlies. So John reluctantly agreed to change the Raptor to red. But if the NBA hadn't stepped in, it would have been a lime green Raptor. And I actually don't know how that would have turned out. And it would have been one that would have lacked, l looked less or more ferocious because they also made some changes to make it a little bit more kid friendly as well. Yeah. So when they were designing the mascot, which was basically based on the logo, what happened was the first designs of the mascot, his face, I think there was like, you know, the, the teeth and all that stuff, his facial expression looked really intimidating. And when they put it on and when they test marketed it, I think they realized that this would actually scare the kids that were coming to the Sky Dome. So John actually took... I think he took a knife and he just basically carved out what he wanted the, the mascot to look like. And that's still what the mascot looks like today. How did the organization make basketball appealing to a hockey city? What was the work that was being done sort of on the community level? Yeah, you know, they had an entire community relations team. And what they did was they reached out um, Al Quance, um, who's, you know, has a long history with basketball here in Toronto and in Canada, led the, um, the movement, they reached out to ambassadors in different communities. So they would find people who were running basketball programs at community centers already in the Chinese community, the black community, the Filipino community, and they would go out, find these people. And what they created was something called a Bell Raptor Ball program, which was a program designed for kids to show up to the gym and they would teach them skills and hopefully eventually get them into playing recreational basketball or at a more competitive level. Um, so this whole program was distributed out to different people. And I reached out to um, Clement Chu, who ran a nonprofit organization at the time called CCYA, which was focused on Chinese Canadian youths. And he had actually connected with um, Al Quance and the Raptors in 95, started this program. And it's wild to me because I know CCY because my nephews who are 11 and nine go to those programs today. You asked me previously about the connections between like the past and the present and things like that. You know, the groundwork that the Raptors laid in terms of the community work, that is also another kind of through line that still continues today. Great stories about players like Damon Stoudemire, a uh, great story of Tracy Murray, and of course the late coach uh, Brendan Malone that really painted the picture of the struggles of an expansion team. Is there a story that sticks out to you uh, that you told that uh, you can share? This team won like, I think like 21 games in the first season when I was reaching out to people in the organization. A lot of them were really excited to talk to me, but a lot of them also asked me like, oh, why are you actually writing a book on this team? Like we didn't do anything on the court. Um, so to me, like a lot of the funny stories is just like the team, the players, especially getting used to the city of Toronto. And one of my favorite stories was John Sally was a veteran. He had been on the Bad Boy Pistons, very established player. But like I mentioned, one of the players taking an expansion draft where he was towards the end of his career. You know, when he came here, one of the first things that he did was he called the PR team and he told them that he wanted to 
take every opportunity in the city to like market himself. He wanted to start a nightclub called Sally's Alley. Like he wanted to start his own underwear brand. He was a big um, kind of club promoter too. So like one of my favorite stories was like he actually had a New Year's party uh, that he hosted, invited a bunch of A-list celebrities that showed up. I, I believe Samuel L. Jackson was there. Um, R&B singer Faith Evans was there. All the players were there. And it was by, um, you know, the docks, like on, um, you know, downtown. And what happened was things got so out of control because, you know, it went over capacity. There was an issue with code check. Uh, people obviously had a lot to drink that at the end of the night, someone actually drove their car onto the like frozen lake and it ended up on the front page of the Toronto Sun. And Isaiah Thomas, who was the general manager at the time, you know, like we mentioned, the Raptors were trying to build this reputation in the community, et cetera, et cetera. He was so upset by that. And John wasn't, John Sally wasn't really playing that much that that incident pretty much led to him getting waived like two weeks later. And then Jimmy King, who was the second round pick of the team, you know, this was his first time coming to Canada. Like he talked about living in Etobicoke and how he would travel around the city, you know, go down Young Street, discover his favorite Chinese restaurants. He went to his, uh, he went to watch uh, Phantom of the Opera and Oliver Miller talked about how one time, you know, there was such a huge snowstorm outside and he had to go to practice. But when he opened his garage, he couldn't get out of his driveway. So it took him two hours to shovel and get to practice and he was late. And Brendan Malone was like, he was really hard on the guys at the time. It was all about discipline and stuff. He actually held up practice and waited for Oliver Miller to arrive uh, before they started practice. So there's all these funny stories about them just dealing with kind of the nuances of, of Toronto and being in Canada for the first time. Of course, there's no snow on the east coast of the U.S., <laughs> right? Of course. So yeah, it's, this, it's is, this, is, uh, this is always the thing is that, um, and a lot of the players too, when I talked to them, like when they were taking the expansion draft, people were describing... Toronto in those ways like a lot of um, you know at Pickney who was another veteran that was picked remember his friends being like hey you know it snows there every day like they've never heard of basketball all this stuff and you know the funny thing is like, I, I wanted to spotlight those stereotypes because a lot of these players if you read the book you'll you'll realize they end up falling in love with the city and I think that still holds true today. In most cases, they're the biggest champions of this city. They're like, I, this is the best city to live in. Uh, which brings me to this question, actually. Did Damon Stoudemire start this narrative or stereotype that star NBA players don't want to play in Toronto? Because, of course, his exit was one that, you know, a lot of people were quite surprised at. It was very public and one that you felt that you grew up with this guy and uh, he's got a big smile on his face and he wants to go back home. I think just over time, people have started to conflate the fact that there's, you know, unhappy superstars in the NBA with the fact that if they're in Toronto, it adds another element because they want, they don't want to be in Toronto. They don't want to be in Canada. Like I think for anyone that follows sports and especially basketball, you know, that player movement is a very huge thing. It was back then. It is still today. Players get traded all the time. They move in for agency, especially superstars, try to dictate where they want to go. I think about Damon Sotomayor, think about Vince Carter, you know, moving on as well. Think about even Kawhi Leonard, like winning a championship and deciding to go home to LA as well. You know, I don't think it's really a Toronto thing, to be honest. You know, I think this is just how the NBA works. Damon at the time was not happy because the team wasn't doing well. And I, I don't think that would have been any different if he was playing in New York, in Boston, but it's, it's just that when, a, when an athlete from Toronto or when an athlete on the Raptors is unhappy and requests those things, I think suddenly there's kind of an insecurity with the fan base um, of, of saying that, hey, like we're not good enough, we're not good enough. But usually most of the times it's, it's just about whether you're good enough on the court. That's when most guys want to leave. The Toronto Raptors, as you mentioned, is Canada's sole NBA team. What is the likelihood another team joins us north of the border? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, Adam Silver, NBA commissioner, recently talked about how, you know, they would be interested to looking at maybe Montreal, maybe Vancouver as viable cities without obviously committing to the fact that they are looking specifically at those places. To me, if I were to be realistic, like, I feel like this is something that's not going to happen in, in the near future. You know, the, I think around NBA circles, there's an assumption that when the expansion cycle comes around again, the next two teams are going to be in Seattle and Las Vegas. And just unfortunately, you look at the demise of the, of the Vancouver Grizzlies, you know, I think it'd be a huge risk. It'd be a huge risk for the, for the NBA to take another chance. Now, do I think 
you know, an NBA franchise could thrive today in a Montreal, in a Vancouver. I think definitely. I think the basketball has continued to grow here in this country if you compare it to when the Raptors came in 95. But if you ask me realistically, I think there's just a lot more different locations in the U.S. that is less risky and more viable for the NBA in, in, the, in the near term. All right. So my last question to you, I'll admit when I got to this part of the book, it's near the end, my heart melted a bit because you you take us through this whole story of, you know, call them misfits, call them, you know, an unlikely group of people to come together. And these folks still to this day, and we're talking players to the coaches to the staff members still keep in touch. Uh, they still see each other regularly. Obviously, COVID interrupted some of that. But tell me about that, because I, I honestly was like, that is we're talking about 25 plus years and it's just like, this is the sweetest thing. Yeah, I, I you know, when I set out to, to work on this book and, and, you know, talk to all these different individuals, like you mentioned, I didn't know that. But as I started to talk to everybody, you know, they would start mentioning that, hey, like I still keep in touch with this person. I still keep in touch with this person. So they recently had their 25th anniversary reunion. And what happened was, like you mentioned, because of COVID, they weren't able to have an in-person celebration. So what happened was a series of Zooms were set up. And John Bitov was on a Zoom with Isaiah Thomas. And then Samuel L. Jackson, who was a celebrity fan in the first season, popped up on the Zoom. I was able to see just the camaraderie and just the connection that these guys have, all because they all work together to like start this franchise. And this summer, you know, they were actually able to organize an in-person reunion finally at Real Sports. And I was able to be there. John Bitov was there. Isaiah Thomas was there. Members of the broadcast team, the dance pack game ops and they got together and they were just you know i was there just kind of fly on the wall watching them just kind of reminisce about everything so i think that's one of the most beautiful parts of this book you know i think there's a lot of funny and quirky stories in there and i think people reading this book will get that kind of vibe of like, like they're they were part of a startup um trying to figure this out on the fly but it's also the relationships that were built and the connections that were made and those are still present today Tomorrow on the agenda. The college system, especially, I think, has fallen further and further behind. And I think we're the only constituency in Canada that, between government grant and tuition, gets less than $10,000 a year per student. That doesn't even cover the cost for domestic students. That's tomorrow on the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.